it again. Good morning and welcome to the land chapter of the Entrepreneur Showcase. My name is Judy Schwartz. I'm a journalist and author and I'm also an example of how slow money makes things happen, though not always in the way that you would expect. So back in 2010, I attended the slow money gathering in Shelburne, at Shelburne Farms, Vermont, just a couple of hours north of where I live. Um, and that was back in the days, I don't know how many of all of you were there, when slow money gatherings were in, in a, it was under a tent. You know, I think I look out here at this incredible space and, and it was a, a big tent. It was a nice tent, but it was still a tent. Um, and um, so I was there with my notebook. I was writing a piece about the slow money gathering. And what happened was that I heard a statement that just wouldn't let me go. And that was that more CO2 has gone into the atmosphere from farm agricultural practices, from the land, compared to the burning of fossil fuels when looked at over time. And I thought, oh, a connection between soil and climate? You know, that sounds kind of important. Why aren't we talking about this? So I started researching and exploring, and that led to my book, which is called Cows Save the Planet and Other Improbable Ways of Restoring Soil to Heal the Earth. And it got started at Slow Money, and so being here makes me, makes me really happy, makes me smile. So the way that this is going to work is that each of our, gosh, the, the word that came to my mind was contestants, but that really <laughs> isn't what we're, each of our presenters, each of our showcased entrepreneurs will present for six minutes and then we will have some questions, have some conversation up here about some of the common things that, we're, that they're all grappling with, we're all grappling with. And then hopefully we will have some time and we'll take questions from the audience. So without further ado, I will introduce to you John Paul Maxfield who will tell you all about his company with the intriguing name of Waste Farmers. So welcome to John Paul. Hi guys. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you Woody and the Soul Money crew. Uh, thank you to each of you. It's been really fun getting to hang out with you guys over the past couple days. And so um, here's our uh, elevator poem, so to speak. Uh, so at the core, so we're waste farmers, and at the core, uh, we're a sustainable agriculture company. And we design and make lifestyle brands that address the world's challenges in positive and sustainable ways. And I'd like to announce that we're very proud to, uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, be B Corp certified, which is great for us. Um, thank you. We're very excited. And so what we're really interested in is how do we feed the world's population and decrease agriculture's environmental footprint. And so we've heard it over the past couple of days, we've got a lot of people to feed um, uh, by 2050, 9 billion people on the planet. And there's an approach that says the only way to feed this many people is through technology to avoid ecological catastrophe and starvation, which sounds really scary. Makes me want to participate in bourbonism. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's other, I think, uh, wiser uh, approaches to it that say big problems don't always require big solutions. And so uh, as a company, we're looking for those simple solutions to complex problems. We have a, a saying that says, uh, believe that there's more than less, but trust that less is more. And so um, this title is high on grass. And though we come from Colorado, I'm not talking about that kind of grass. Um, look at this statistic. 40.5 million acres are dedicated to lawns in this country. Nine million is, is, is corn. And so instead of drones and, and chemicals, um, we've got a lot of farmers in our perspective who are just growing the wrong stuff. Um, and so sometimes answers are under our feet. And if we were to grow in the biointensive method of 5,000 square feet, and we converted those lawns to food production, we could feed a lot of people. And so it's just as an example of how sort of we approach um, business, how we approach life, trying to, to understand um, simple solutions. So, as we move from organic to farm to table, we propose also arm to table. Um, 
And so that's our poem, and now we're going to sort of get into the, the brass tacks, as, you, as it were. Uh, our vision is to build a portfolio of brands uh, at the intersection of healthy homes, uh, lifestyle, and food. So we have two brands right now, Maxfields, which is our food gardening, food gardening and urban farming brand, uh, and Bad 64, which is our indoor agriculture brand. And then we've got future brands that we'll grow into, and we're going to grow through our brands, channels, geographies, uh, product, and then product innovation. And so our growth strategy uh, is, you know, focused and starts with soil, just like any good system. So soil are the products that we started with. That's our foundation. We'll continue to grow and cultivate long-term relationships with our customers and retailers. And then we'll expand our core uh, by offering new products and expanding um, from there. So we operate in some big markets. Food gardening is a $3.5 billion market, fastest growing segment of the $60 billion uh, lawn and garden market. Uh, $2.57 billion is spent on inputs for indoor production. So we're dealing with uh, some, some, some big markets, uh, fast-growing markets. These are a snapshot of our current products. Uh, Maxfields is designed for people growing food on balconies and pots to people converting their lawns. And the important thing about that is if we're going to grow food in small places, we need minerally uh, and nutritionally rich soil for nutritional food. And so that's what we offer there. Uh, we sell through independent lawn and garden, Whole Foods, uh, and hardware. Batch 64 is our brand for indoor production. Covers growers from beginning to a little bit more professional. Uh, sold through hydroponic retailers across the country. Um, and this is just a snapshot of our brands, very yin and yang. Uh, Maxfields is, is uh, grow food, eat well, live full. Batch 64 is very much more of a, a Red Bull type brand. Um, and our business milestones, uh, we have grown 100% year over year, uh, 2013 to 2014. Uh, our brands will exceed uh, $1 million in sales next year after only two years on the market. Um, and we've got distribution through Whole Foods, which is great. But more importantly for us, we produce out of our microbe brewery, and uh, we're, we're nerds, um, and our farm. And we've had 1,000 visits to our farm for people to learn about the biointensive method. Um, we have an employee crop share, which I, I don't know that there's anything like that. Uh, every employee of the company goes home with a fresh box of produce from our farm. Um, so, and then we have a, a CSA that we're expanding. Um, and we've received recognition. We were named Environmentalist of the Year uh, in, in Colorado, um, Green Business of the Year. Um, and we're going to leverage those, uh, the successes that we had to continue to launch new brands and new products through our channels. And so what's cooking? Um, we'll just say it's a protein worth chirping about and leave it at that. Um, and so for us, we've you know, raised three quarters of a million dollars, but our governor, it reminds me a lot of the mayor actually of, uh, Kentucky, or of uh, Louisville, um, he talks about business as an ecosystem, and we want to build a redwood, or grow a redwood. We want to be here for a long, long time. And uh, we've raised money uh, to date, three quarters of a million from really great investors. But as we grow, we're going to continue to need really great investors that share our value. And that's sort of why we're here. Um, the important thing for us um, is to find those. And so uh, my contact information is in the book. I'm speaking at the chamber at 4 o'clock in Denver, so I'm catching an 11.05 flight. So I'm going to exit stage left here in a little bit. Um, Tom Abood is here, I hope. Um, Tom, if, if, if anyone has any questions, I'm hoping that you, know, you can connect us. Um, but regardless, really grateful for this opportunity, and I hope that you guys will um, connect with us and help us grow. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Narendra Varma from Our Table Cooperative, who we heard from a bit yesterday in our discussion of culture. Thank you very much um, to everyone at Slow Money for allowing me uh, the opportunity to be here today. It's a real honor. Um, um, as I mentioned yesterday, um, my wife and I started down this path in 2010, and we were very aware of all the problems um, that we face as a society and as a species um, that other folks have mentioned at this conference, but we also saw a great deal of opportunity. For one, the aging farmer population and that 400 million acres that Severin and others mentioned, um, I see as a huge opportunity. It's our chance as a society to decide if that land should go into the hands of large corporations or absentee landowners or if we should do something different with it. 
Um, second, um, this country needs a new generation of farmers, millions and millions of more severins, um, which is kind of uh, interesting, um, in a good way. Um, and really, the, the, you know, the, the only realistic way for us to feed the planet is with small-scale agriculture. Vandana mentioned yesterday that 70% of the global food supply comes from small-scale agriculture. That's not the situation in this country, but I think we can get there pretty easily. Um, these are, of course, big problems, um, but I do believe that the solutions must be local. And we really need to come together as communities to reimagine what these local food systems should look like. Um, so the key problems, as I said yesterday, are systemic externalities, and in response, we need systemic solutions to close the loops. Um, judging by our current behavior, our existing values and cultural mythology are really sort of insufficient. And so the question becomes, what are the new stories we want to tell? What are our new values? To paraphrase Wendell Berry, we need to close the loops by building locally adapted economies based on local nature, local as in contemporary sunlight, local people, and I would add local capital. To me, this is exactly what slow money is about, and these are the values that we started with. Minimize or, external, or excuse me, eliminate externalities in order to steward and regenerate the land, the people, and our communities. Once we had these values, we needed to design and create the structures that embody them, and we needed to invest in these structures. Our solution was to develop a multi-stakeholder co-op that models a complete closed-loop community-scale food system, and we call it our table. Um, let's get into some specifics. Our co-op at the top left there, I'm gonna go in clockwise order, starts with a 60-acre farm located just 15 miles from downtown Portland, where we grow a diversity of plants and livestock and which also acts as the physical base for all of our infrastructure and operations. We then extend the breadth and depth of our offerings by aggregating product from other producers and farmers in our region. All of this product comes into our facilities, which offer cold storage, warehousing, and delivery logistics. Some goes to an on-site commercial kitchen, and the rest of it ends up into retail channels, including an on-farm grocery store that we just opened a couple of days ago. And from there, all this food ends up in our community's homes and in their bellies. The result is a community that can meet the vast majority of its dietary needs in a completely seasonal and locally sourced way. Everyone who participates in this system, from farmer to consumer, is a member of the cooperative. Everyone has a seat at the table, everyone gets a vote, and everyone shares in the profits. The goal is an interdependent relationship around food versus faceless transactions. In other words, this structure is trying to close the loops of the community-scale food economy. So let me talk a little bit about the farm. Um, on the farm, we practice biodynamic principles to sort of think about closing loops and looking at the entire farm as a single organism. Um, we are certified organic and are moving towards biodynamic certification. We spent the last three years restoring the land and building infrastructure. But of course, more important than uh, infrastructure is people. We currently have 16 employees um, and members of the co-op on the top left over there. Um, and we have 10 regional producers, independent farmers and food artisans who are selling product through the co-op brand. And they're shown on the bottom right. All the food is sold under the co-op's brand, which we call certified local food. And we also sell our products, um, in addition to our on-site grocery store, we also sell it through other um, local groceries and rest restaurants and a CSA. Um, our on-site kitchen uses these ingredients to create a full array of prepared foods, everything from pickles and jams and preserves to fully prepared meals that people can take home. Um, none of this would be possible without folks who eat our food, of course. Um, our customers are members of the cooperative with an equal voice at the table. At the end of the day, we didn't just want to be another group of producers saying, buy our carrots, they taste better than the other guys. We really felt that this was a conversation that the whole community had to have together and that the eaters in the system had to be equal participants at the table. Our first consumer member who's pictured over there, Cecil Denny, was a CSA customer who walked into the farm one day for a, for a little visit and um, said that you know, he would really like his money to, to uh, match his values and to help build a better world for his grandkids. He hadn't heard of slow money but he was embodying it in every way. A few days later, he made us a $50,000 loan with interest paid in food, okay? He then, this gets better, 
proceeded to donate that food interest to the food bank. This man was walking the talk in a way that can inspire us all. Let's do the numbers. We had $140,000 in gross revenue in 2013, and we will gross about $250,000 in 2014. In addition to about $325,000 in startup capital for the co-op from my family, we've raised an additional $275,000 from six other individual investors, one of whom is in the room today. Um, and we anticipate needing an additional $400,000 over the next two years. So to conclude, um, I'd like to leave you with a quote that somebody told me yesterday. She said, we have tried to conquer nature by force and by intellect. It now remains for us to try the way of love. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no. Next, let's, let's welcome Susan Aram from the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust. Thank God that wasn't a worse wardrobe malfunction, right? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Two years ago, my husband and I were sitting on folding chairs in a dark little community hall in a tiny Iowa town, waiting for a farm auction to start. Next to us was Grant, a young farmer. And you can check with Severn, but I do believe this morning he's still single. <laughs> he had just taught us about growing organic fruit and nut trees and how he was going to incorporate small grass-fed livestock and how he'd never disturb the soil again. He'd convinced us that this auction for 40 acres or 105 or 145 acres total was the best chance he'd have of farming. And we were there to write the check out of our retirement fund to get him going. And by the way, we hadn't even heard of slow money yet. Behind us was a hefty group of older farmers who all seemed to know each other. With that crowd and corn prices driving land up over 10,000 an acre, we figured we'd get one bid on the 40 acres and we'd be out of there in five minutes. You see, Paul and I had moved back to Iowa to retire, and we saw the destruction unleashed all around us by industrial ag. You've heard it here already, environmental degradation, young people locked out of farming. We wanted to help rebuild the land and our community, so we figured getting a sustainable farmer on the land, growing good food, was one thing we could do. But we're not rich people. 40 acres seemed like an awful lot, and 145 off the charts. But as the auction progressed, we couldn't believe our ears. The price wasn't going up. The auctioneer looked like he was going to have a stroke. His face was all red, and that little you know, vein was about to pop. <laughs> he threatened to shut the auction down. Grant, he used to be a realtor, so he started pecking away at his calculator and flashing it at us. And he said, we could buy the whole 145 for this price. We could put our money down, and he could cover the mortgage payments. Yeah. So we walked out of that auction entirely tapped out of our liquid assets. We had $700,000 of debt, and we're retired. <laughs> the annual mortgage payment on this was more than our annual income, just to put it in perspective. So, and we had literally bought the farm. <sighs> yeah. So, it was our dream, right? So part of the plan was to preserve this land to grow food even after Grant was done with it, okay? So I figured a couple of phone calls to some natural heritage groups and we'd be done. No, right. Dozens of phone calls around the state and around the country and I couldn't find anyone anywhere who would take a donated easement on a working farm in Iowa. And even if we could find a farm preservation group, we realized it would take Grant years to build up enough credit to buy it from us so we could roll our interest-free down payment over to a new, a new beginning farmer. And at our ages, we wouldn't make a dent before we croaked. So meanwhile, we were watching these developers um, paving over the best farmland in the world. That's where the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust came from. And yeah, we're taking back the word, sustainable. I've spent 30 years organizing workers and neighbors. I don't believe in duplicating effort, wasting time, or spending money I don't have. But I couldn't ignore what I now understood. The future of the Heartland's local food movement depends on our ability to preserve this farmland that's most threatened by development, and no one in Iowa is doing it. So we've pulled together the who's who of sustainable ag in Iowa. Some of you might know Denise O'Brien, founder of the Women, Food, and Ag Network, former president of the National Family Farm Coalition, or Fred Kirschman from Stone Barns and the Leopold Center. That's the caliber we're talking about. And we've got a couple of dozen of those. 
as well as planners and policymakers from around the state of Iowa ready to support silt. We could fight developers if we wanted to, but whoever really wins that one. So we're gonna work with them on this like they do in some other states. Let's put living, breathing grant wood prints in the middle of our developments while protecting them as farms forever. Let developers make their money off the view, but let our farmers grow, sell their produce out their back door. In the meantime, we're gonna take the price of land out of the equation for sustainable farmers forever while still allowing them to gain equity in their homes, barns, and businesses. We face a lot of challenges in the ethanol and corn syrup capital of the world, but our farms will create growing green belts around our communities, making natural food producing buffers between homes and industrial ag. In the land of the monocrop, our leaders are beginning to understand that diverse farming operations build resilience in our economy as well as in our environment. So here's the plan. We start with a major public launch in early 2015 to solicit farm donations because we know there are elderly Iowans out there looking for this solution. They just don't know we exist. We don't have time, we don't have a decade for them to hear about us by word of mouth. But we've already had our first farm committed, worth more than three quarters of a million dollars, by a 70-year-old woman who's still out there planting nut trees for the next generation, by the way. We've also soft-circled two and a half million from four donors, and we're in discussions with other supporters. So if folks are donating their farms, and some people are at least talking about writing checks, what are we doing here, right? Well, silt leaders have spent their lives making this world a better place to live, eat, and grow. But they sure didn't make the millions we need right now. Iowa's elderly farmers are dying off as we speak. An endowment in place now will give farmland owners a safe place to donate their farms. With a first year operating budget in place now, we can launch an outreach campaign, push legislation for public funding, and hire the right experts for the job when the phone starts ringing. With enough support from you, we can assure landowners that silt will be around to protect their farms forever. They must be able to trust us, and we must be able to do this right. Everything is in place except the money. Substantial support from you is the only way that's gonna happen soon enough. We might call ourselves slow money, but we're here today with an urgent plea. Help us save Iowa's farmland before it's paved over or plowed under by some industrial giant. Let us get the next generation of healthy food farmers on the land before it's too late. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Stephanie Boursier with her company, Farm Fuel. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephanie Borsier. I am the CEO of Farm Fuel. We're based out of Watsonville, California, in the Central Coast. We are farming, manufacturing, and as someone yesterday suggested very correctly, as entrepreneurs, we're an educational company. Our mission, our products, and our educational programs are replacing chemical pesticides, making farmers more successful, and growing healthy soil. I'm going to share with you some images of what we do and why we do it. First, this field represents the core of what we do at Farm Fuel. This is 60 acres of mustard grown at the historic Level Lee Farm in Pescadero, California. That tiny little town in the background is Pescadero, about one mile east of the Pacific Ocean and 40 miles south of San Francisco. We harvest this, this field in the fall of 2012, and in about the, sp the spring of 2012, when this picture was taken, we got some compl complaints that we had turned the whole town yellow, so um, we're successful at that. Okay. I'd like to introduce you to the founders of Farm Fuel. It's a collection of organic farmers and scientists who got together in 2007. In the upper right-hand corner, moving counterclockwise, is Robert Van Buskirk. He's a, uh, an energy efficiency expert at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Next are Henry Smith with our biodiesel machine and Larry Jacobs from Jacobs Farm Del Cabo. Ken Kimes and his wife Sandra Ward from New Natives Microgreens in the Central Coast of California. And finally Jim Crocken from Swantonbury. Jim and Larry are additionally founding members of Slow Money. So as the name Farm Fuel implies, we started as a, as a fuel company. The idea was to create a homegrown biodiesel industry for the Central Coast of California. What we've learned is not only can we grow a mustard crop in rotation that can offset on-farm on energy needs, we can also grow our own fertilizer and pest control. What we do is we grow hot mustards that are high in oil content. 
So in a nutshell, the same chemical that creates the spicy taste when you bite into a hot radish or you eat some wasabi can be found in the mustard seed. And this spiciness is further concentrated when you remove the oil, which we make that oil into biodiesel. When we add the mustard seed meal, which is the seed without the oil, to the soil, and then you add water, we get that wasabi-like reaction in the soil. And this we can use to control pests in the soil. So I'll, I'll spare you the biochemistry lesson, it's a little early, um, but I will tell you that learning how to biofumigate with mustard seed meal has drastically widened the scope of farm fuel. So the idea that you can use plant-based products to replace pre-plant fumigation is particularly important to us at Farm Fuel. For those of you who do not live near farms that use these pesticides, this is a berry block. Um, it's right down the road from our warehouse and our little organic farm in Watsonville. Um, this is before the plants go in. And this is probably being fumigated with methyl bromide or chlorpicrin. So they, they gas the soil underneath that big plastic tarp. But surrounding that tarp, you can see some hoop houses with um, raspberries that are being actively harvested. So methyl bromide and chlorpicin are some pretty major chemical pesticides, but they're also the foundation of the berry industry in California and internationally. Their purpose is to eliminate fungal and bacterial pests in the soil. Methyl bromide is also particularly good at getting rid of weed seed and nematodes. However, methyl bromide was banned internationally as it is a greenhouse gas known to deplete the ozone. The berry industry has held on to the use of methyl bromide through fed federal critical use exemptions, but these are running out. Additionally, other fumigants are facing severe restrictions. So what we're facing in California is a major industry without critical tools for soil disinfestation. Additionally, throughout the United States and internationally, we have both conventional and organic farmers of all sizes facing the same pests without sufficient tools to control soil-borne pathogens. At Farm Fuel, we now not only have a commercial blend of mustard seed meal that we use a as a fertilizer, and soon we'll have a, pr a product with the EPA biopesticide label, but we've also commercialized a soil treatment process called anaerobic soil disinfestation. We call it ASD for short because it's a terrible name, but it's shown here in this photo. Um, the mustard-based products in ASD make up essentially two of the three non-chemical tools growers have to control soil disease. In 2011, we treated about 16 acres of ground in California with these methods and our products, mostly in tested demo sites. This year, in 2014, we will have treated more than 1,000 acres in California. Woo, that's, that's hard work. So what we do is not limited to berries. Um, although this is an industry we are supporting with non-toxic replacements for chemical pesticides. We additionally work with row vegetable crops, orchards, marijuana, and nursery growers. So this is our mission. We're creating better on-farm energy sustainability and replacing chemical pesticides with plant-based solutions. Financially, we have done this with $750,000 in investments over seven years. We plan to open a second manufacturing facility in the Pacific Northwest and expand our programs outside California. We're looking to raise an additional $750,000 to support expansion and research and development. Revenues year-to-date exceed $2.5 million. So I urge you to visit our website or come find me if you're interested in more details about our biodiesel program, on-farm consultation services, soil programs, or products. You can also visit our website to learn more about our grower education programs or watch videos of past seminars we have hosted for the grower community. Thank you. And next, we have Will Harris of White Oak Pastures. Greetings from the deep south. <laughs> the uh, White Oak Pastures is the name of our family farm. It's multi-generational, multi-species, vertically integrated. And uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, a number of things we're very proud of, and we're particularly grateful to slow food for allowing us to come and shout it from the mountain for a minute today. I'm grateful for that. The, uh, mo th the thing that's most satisfying to me is that in the 150 years that my family has uh, operated this farm, we've come full circle. My great-grandfather came there in 1866. 
If he would have operated the farm in a manner that was uh, very environmentally sustainable and with a high level of animal welfare, his son, my grandfather, would have run the farm in much the same way. Uh, my father took the farm over uh, post-World War II in what was ironically called the Green Revolution. And under his watch, it became a monoculture of only cattle in which we used all the tools that science had given us to increase production. Uh, I took over the farm after attending the University of Georgia, majoring in animal science, and ran it as an industrial farm for 20 years. Uh, commencing in the mid-90s, we began the gradual return to the high animal welfare, highly environmentally sustainable practices of my great-grandfather. And my... And my daughters uh, have taken that up and, uh, and their spouses and are doing a great job as well. You know, I, I learned that the transition is a, a journey, not a destination. You know, I believe when I first started transitioning in the mid-90s that if I gave up uh, subtherapeutic antibiotics and uh, hormone implants and, uh, I don't know, and confinement feeding of my cattle, then that was all I had to do, and, I, and, and I'd be the guy. Uh, I, I then realized that, you know, you, got, you can't be using synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, and then I learned that uh, uh, the worst thing I was doing was the monoculture. You know, nature abhors a monoculture. The, uh, so it was uh, gradually we, uh, we added species, we built a red meat abattoir, a slaughterhouse on the farm. We built a poultry abattoir, a slaughterhouse on the farm. We're the only farm in the country that has both those on premises. We later added other things, a restaurant, lodging. The, uh, today we uh, pasture, raise, and hand butcher five different red meat species. Cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits. We pasture, raise, and hand butcherify poultry species, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, and ducks. We, uh, we raise certified organic uh, vegetables. We raise pastured eggs, uh, and a number of other things. Uh, uh, our controller say, likes to say that we're a 150-year-old farm that operates in a state of perpetual startup. And, we, <laughs> and it's just the damn truth. Uh, we, uh, we, make, uh, we have a number of uh, small ancillary businesses on the farm that could never withstand uh, financially on their own, but as part of the organism that we call White Oak Pastures, it works very nicely. We make uh, biodiesel to run our tractors from the fat. We make, uh, that spins off glycerin, and we make soap <clears throat> and candles. We, uh, we have our own farm restaurant uh, where we uh, feed our 117 employees lunch six days a week, supper two nights a week. We uh, have lodging on the farm uh, that where we are uh, in, uh, starting agritourism with emphasis on education, not recreation. Uh, we operate on 2,500 acres of land. It's the largest certified organic farm in the state. Uh, we raise all the animals that we uh, process in our abattoirs except cattle. Uh, I cannot, sorry, I, have, I don't have enough land to do that. Uh, I source cattle from other farmers who are unwilling to uh, take it to the next level, certified organic, uh, GMO free. Uh, we are trying to raise about $20 million to buy about 6,000 acres of land uh, to uh, take our farm to the next level. Uh, in, uh, when we started this, I was a con conventional cattleman, sold about half a million dollars worth of cattle, had three minimum wage employees. Today we've got 117 employees. We sell 25 to $30 million worth of product a year. Nobody makes minimum wage. It's cash flow positive and profitable. We did that in 10 years. A number of different certifications. Uh, the lights blinking, time and modesty preempts me from reading the uh, recognitions. 
But uh, I do thank you for having me here today. All right, we have some time left for conversation. And I have a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. I'll direct this question to Stephanie, but of course, anyone that has something to add, you know, jump right in. But in terms of what one might need funding for, one a aspect that we haven't heard much about here at this conference is R&D. And I'd just like you to share a little bit about, you know, what challenges you have and where that fits into the picture. Sure, and I think um, any farmer is ultimately an engineer. Um, there's always a time when they um, need a piece of equipment that maybe they don't have access to. I don't know if you have that experience, Willie. Um, where we live in California, we have a lot of need for engineering, um, manufacturing for different pieces of equipment that can help us replace pesticides. Um, and um, as well as uh, harvesting equipment, um, I've been to some parts of the country recently where they, um, they really needed harvesting equipment because there was such a lack of labor for harvesting um, that just by some simple harvesting equipment development, um, could, they could you know, go from something that was maybe a, a lower value crop to a higher value crop with better, better equipment. Um, What's dear to our heart at Farm Fuel is uh, soil health and um, learning more about soil um, microbiology and how soil can be suppressive to, to disease. It's sort of, in my opinion, the new frontier. And um, we're learning a lot right now. There's a great study at UC Davis looking at how compost can help. Um, compo compost as an input can help uh, suppress disease for all types of different farmers. And you know that's something we really need to learn more about in order to better um, decrease pesticide use, make our farms more efficient. Excellent. Any, any of you like to add to that? Or should we leap into the next? OK, and this one is directed towards Susan. And it looks like you've made a, you were, as you were developing silt, whether to go in a direction of a profitable, a profit-making ent entity or a nonprofit, so let's hear a little bit about that because that's something that many um, people will explore. So, some of you are familiar with Iroquois Valley. Um, we have some other LLCs in Iowa that are trying to tackle this issue of um, saving that farmland and transitioning it to beginning farmers or younger farmers, either one. They're not always the same. Uh, and uh, we, I investigated that. I, I called up a lot of people who know a lot more about money than I do, uh, trying to see if that's the route to go. But if you look the next generation, the next transition down the road, you see that it's not solving the problem ultimately. And we can all feel very good about investing uh, slow money into an LLC that will get a farmer on the ground in seven years at a very low interest rate. Um, but what happens for the next generation? And when that farmer sells, when he or she is older and, and needs that retirement fund, as, as they all do, um, and it still it continues to ratchet up the price of that farmland. And the only thing we could see that would solve that problem ultimately was to take that land off the market, simply have the trust own it. And um, we'll, we will lease the land to the farmer at market rate, but that marker, that farmer will then get deductions for the more sustainable practices that he or she employs. So we're hoping to keep it as affordable as possible while still maintaining that competitiveness that should be fair between all farmers, those who are in that multi-million dollar debt and those who are not. Okay, thank you. Any of you like to add to that? Okay, we'll move on. All right, so Will, those numbers that you didn't get a chance to share um, is that your, your farm produces about $30 million worth of products, the many products that you described, a year. Is this the most important yield of your efforts? And if not, what would be? It used to be. Uh, when I was an industrial commodity cattle producer, 
The, the, high, the purpose of the farm was to produce as many pounds of beef as it could for the lowest possible production cost. And that was the whole focus all day, every day. Uh, today it's not true anymore. Uh, the, 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 uh, the people, the land, and the, the animals of white oak pastures are the focus. And the products are like the blood that pumps through our body. It's what's spun off by the organism that allows the cash to keep it operating. Okay, thank you. Okay, this question I'll direct to Narendra, but this one you might all have something to say about. Okay, so I'd like to, you to address the challenge of pursuing regenerative agriculture in an economic context in which what happens on the land for good or, or what happens to the land for good or for ill is really external to the economies that you're dealing with. So we first started as a farm incubator and um, we had this um, very swanky looking permaculture design for the farm which I like to call permaculture Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And um, what we saw happening very, very quickly is that the ethic that was underlying that management strategy which was really based around kind of commons management for the long term was very much at odds with essentially the principles of individual capitalism as practiced in America today. So we literally had a conversation. Which one do we want to keep? And we decided that maybe it was time for a better economic system that actually incentivized that kind of land management instead of the other way around. So that's where the idea of a cooperative economic system and, and sort of legal structure and all of that business structure came from. And for us, this idea of a multi-stakeholder co-op that brings together the entire food community is an embodiment of that value system. And I am hopeful that in the long term, those two will work in concert and support each other rather than being at odds. Yes? Yeah, so the, uh, the other night, um, our first night of the big conference, I introduced myself to Elliot Coleman, which was pretty audacious. And, and, he, and he said, oh, I, I have something for you, which made my day, so thank you, Elliot. I'll be telling this story forever. And uh, we pulled aside and he pulled out a flyer, that he, something he had written up about co-farming. He said, I took this idea from co-housing. And uh, it's a wonderful write-up on the idea of, of getting a lot of people on a big parcel of land, but each of them doing their part on that parcel, much like a cooperative. And I, I enjoy this, uh, this creative aspect of the notion of our land trust, because I think all kinds of permutations are going to come out of of each parcel that we manage to get donated or maybe eventually buy. And we're gonna be able to, to have co-ops, and I'm on the Farmers Union board, we're big fans of co-ops. Um, and sometimes we'll have individual entrepreneurs, we'll see, but I, I think once you own the land, there's an amazing possibility for creative, cooperative farming. Anything either of you would you like to add about, about bringing regenerative the understanding of regenerative agriculture into our economic system or, or developing an economic structure to support regenerative agriculture? In our case, we think of it as, as, as farming the animals, but also farming people. We have, a, we have a young people on our farm from 18 different states that came there to learn our form of sustainable and, and humane animal husbandry, and you know, those people will, you know, they won't be on white oak pastures well. You know, they'll go off you know, on their own. I think that, uh, the, the, you know, I'm a fan of the land grant system, but that's not where you learn how to farm the way we farm. You go to a farm that uh, you believe you want to emulate that system, and, and then you learn it, then you go do it somewhere else. Excellent. It looks like we're going to have some time for audience questions, and I'm as surprised as maybe you all are, so if anyone would like to come up, that would be great. And in the meantime, do you, Stephanie, do you have anything to add about, about the challenges of regenerative agriculture? Oh, well, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, to me, I, I'm so soil-focused, you know, it all comes back to soil and growing soil, like, 
know, your folks has been um, growing soil and growing people, and through that you can grow food. And ultimately, you know, that's what we're all here to, to talk about. So, excellent. Okay, so we'll have a question. Thank you. I'm Rosalie Cates from Missoula, Montana. All the presentations are so inspirational. Thank you. Narenda, I'm really curious, um, just trying to get an idea of how much population is needed to support a co-op like you've started. So do you know your break-even revenues or maybe some idea of how many customers you have to attract? Thank you. Um, yes, we do. Um, in terms of population, although we are on the outskirts of a major metropolitan area, what's interesting about our location is that within a five-mile radius, there's about 40,000 households. Um, so we're really very much in, in what I would consider a suburban um, area. Um, in terms of the specific numbers, um, maybe those are better discussed in private. Um, I believe that there's some legalities around these things, and I'm not sure where all those boundaries lie, so perhaps we can talk about them in private. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leslie Christian. Um, luckily, I'm going to ask Susan a question, which is about a nonprofit, so we don't have to worry about the... Uh, securities laws. Um, Susan, what are you looking for in terms of money? Um, I got so en enticed and excited and then I didn't hear what your actual uh, needs are. So I'm just curious about that. Well, Thanks. as usual, you know, the more the merrier. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but what, I'm, what I'm prepared to tell the uh, 25 uh, people from the, what I'm calling the Land Trust Brain Trust in December when we have our founding retreat is that we can't launch without a million dollars in the bank. I mean, I cannot, in good conscience, go out to any 75-year-old lady and say, I want your $4 million farm, and I have $50,000 in the bank. She has no reason to believe what we're going to be here in 20 years. So um, a million is our goal, our first goal. Thank you. Our second goal? <laughs> no, three million. <laughs> no, I mean, our second, with one million, we, we see, you know, 50,000 and, uh, you know, that we could apply toward, well, we're also hoping for an operating budget of 200,000 for the first year, but if, even if we had 50,000, at least we could do a really respectable PR campaign throughout Iowa. We have 54 people per, eight, per mile in Iowa. We need to get the word out in a lot of other ways than word of mouth, because it's hard to shout that far. Um, so that's what we're looking for. Hi, I'm Derek Denkla, leader of Listoma NYC, and we uh, just recently launched a, a partnership in collaboration with Working Farms Capital, which is the manager of Iroquois Valley Farms, to start a local farms fund, which uh, will help young farmers in particular buy small parcels that they're not able to uh, capture with the existing funds from FSA and other sources. So I was intrigued by your comment saying that you thought that that wasn't a long-term solution, or do you see it as something that the land trusts and, and, a, and an investor-based solution like that could uh, work together, or, or could you explain that a little bit further? I'd be glad to. Uh, hello. Okay. So I'd be glad to do that. Um, I see a great partnership with these LLCs and the trust in that, uh, and I've already spoken to a couple of them briefly about this, but we come in, we put an ag easement on that land. So we make sure it's always agriculture forever. And that will control the price of that land over time. The investors can still make their one to three or five percent, whatever it is they're gonna make over time. Um, but once that land is owned by that farmer, he or she will not be able to turn around in 40 years and sell it to development because it'll be controlled by that restrictive covenant. I see that partnership working out quite nicely. Uh, it doesn't go as far as we might go with land, trust, uh, land that the land trust owns, but I, I certainly think it's an, an important con 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 contributor to the escalating land prices over time. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Christian Thalker, and I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, for the biodiesel folks, I'm curious. Um, the world cancer uh, authorities, you know, all say that Diesel pollution is, you know, a leading cause of climate change and lung cancer. And unfortunately, we're in the state that had, that's number one for lung cancer deaths. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, is biodiesel a great solution, um, you know, to help not only farmers, um, but the general public? You know, I'm thinking, you know, anybody in an ambulance, you know, um, a school bus a barge, a plane, a generator, not just tractors. Thank you. Um, well, like I said, I think there's a lot of opportunity for research and development. I think that um, finding new 
uh, resources for energy on the farm and in our society is obviously very important. To us, biodiesel is added value to what we do already, um, and our infrastructure essentially requires diesel or biodiesel. We have irrigation pumps that use greater than a gallon of diesel per hour and run 20 hours a day. So if we can offset that um, cost for our farmers um, with a more sustainably grown fuel source, it's really important to us. But yeah, no, I mean, there's definitely better ways to do it, so. Okay. Thomas Henderson, Logansport, Indiana. Uh, Will, I love your accent because I'm from your neck of the woods and I'd be damned if I'm gonna give up y'all. Uh, this is my first year at Slow Money and it's been an epiphany because it fits who I am. And I'm on next steps process of finding my life again. And so this is directed to Susan, I live in the Midwest heartland of Indiana, which is monoculture, row to row, GMO. When I talk to the farmers in my county, they just don't get it. And I'm interested in seeing how we go about forming land trust with a population that doesn't get it. And we'll, I'd love to bring a lot of the large scale farmers down to see your place. And you're, cool. you're an animal science major from Georgia. I'm an animal science major from Clemson and it's liable to be we met once upon a time and they probably lifted a brew or two. <laughs> but I applaud what you're doing because getting farmers to see sustainable agriculture is nothing new. It's been done for ages just to see a productive, economically viable farm is so important. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, I, I'll just wrap it up quickly. Uh, $7 corn, nobody's going to listen to us about changing the way they're farming. But that's coming down, as it does inevitably. And that's when farmers start looking for innovation, innovative solutions to feed their families. That's when we start carving off land for bits of fruit and vegetable and all that hippie stuff that they thought it was when it was $7 corn. So we can do this. We just talk to the right people at the right time. Okay. I, th I think we're... Think we have one more question? Yes. Thank you. One of the, I'm so excited, Susan, about this process in Iowa. But one of the things that I've looked at with reference to trust formation and repopulation of monocultured uh, lands is that you've got to have like some kind of echo village or residential component to it mm -hmm. because there's no infrastructure. Right. And so I'm wondering if you'd be good enough to comment on your plans for that. Well, first we get the land, but if we get the land in the right place, we're already talking to developers. Um, like I said, in this particular case, they're not necessarily the enemy. We want to keep markets next to their farmers. If we can work with planners, county planners and city planners who are already talking about septic systems versus sewer systems and they know the infrastructure there, they already know the next growth area around each community. And we have developers who are already salivating over those growth areas. If we can work with them to make sure the the houses and the farms, because these are neighborhood friendly farms, these are not spraying farms, right, with CAFOs on them. If we can get them working together, we're gonna have what we need, whether they're an echo village or whether it's simply an organic farm operating around, you know, surrounded by homes. But this is happening in Kane County, Illinois, and a number of other communities. We're, we're gonna take best practices from around the country, we're gonna learn the mistakes that some of them have made, and we're gonna go from there. <clears throat> That's a very good question, and in our situation, uh, employee housing is the greatest impediment to growth we have over van land. Uh, the little town of Bluffton, Georgia, is sits, we could sort of surround it on two, three sides. And uh, it had 400 people in the 1900 census. 
Uh, today, the census says 102, but they're not 102 people there. Somebody lied. <laughs> we, we've uh, bought and renovated 10 houses in town, and I want to comment because we've just found about, uh, there's a uh, program called, uh, this doesn't spell anything, the acronym is not good, USDA Own Farm Farm Worker Housing. And they will lend money to farmers to build houses at 1% interest, 33-year amortization. And, we're, and it's not concrete bunkers where you store employees. You can build nice, efficient houses, comfortable houses. And uh, we, we are applying for that now. I'm really excited about revitalizing our little town. Do we have time for one more? I think we have until 10.20. Okay. Yes. I have a question for Narenda. Um, my name's Mariba Mansfield, and I'm the chair of an urban farm in Columbus, Ohio, but there are dozens of uh, urban farms. And in the spirit of education as part of entrepreneurship that we've talked about the last couple of days, I wonder if you have any plans for sharing your model and transplanting this cooperative model to other communities. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the co-op principles um, that all co-ops are supposed to abide by is sharing information. And the, the, you know, it, it sounds great on paper, but how does it actually work? When we were forming this co-op, um, we called around, I would call, routinely call other co-ops all over the world, and always got very helpful responses. So in that spirit, we share every single legal document we've ever produced. We share all of our structures and information freely, and that's thousands and thousands of hours worth of, of work. Um, and we also have an educational nonprofit that operates off of the land that does educational programs and is something that we really wish to ramp up. So that is very much a part of what our mission is. Okay, I think we do have time for, for another question. Mary Berry mentioned that there was, it's a great time to get into farming, that there is 1% money available from banks. So my question is, what, what is the access to capital from regular, regular old sources like banks if it's available at 1%? How does that, how does that work? I hadn't found any of that 1% money at the bank. <laughs> I was going to talk to Mary about that. <laughs> the, uh, I, I, uh, interest is lower than it's been in my life, uh, but uh, you know, uh, uh, usually it's uh, one over prime, but it's a floor of something four percent. It's just one, you know, one over prime, not go below point. Were Georgia Farmer of the Year in 2013? I did get that read. It would seem to me you'd be a great risk for a banker. So, what what has their response been? I assume you've talked to them. I, I don't know why for a loan I didn't get. I don't know what to ask for. I've never applied. I've never applied for a loan that. I was turned down for, but I know what to ask for and what not to ask for. Uh, we built seven and a half million dollars worth of uh, further processing over and above our farm, the abattoirs, the restaurant, the cabins, and, uh, and been able to borrow the money. Uh, it's, I, I couldn't borrow enough money to buy as much land as I need because land is, is priced dearly, as Mr. Barry said. You can't put a value on it. And there's so much competition for people like me against the doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs that uh, buy land for pride of ownership. So that's, uh, I've, had, I've had no trouble borrowing money to operate my business. It's just to take it to another level that uh, creative funding becomes necessary. Thank you. Well, that wraps it up. And I just want to remind everybody that there will be opportunities to speak to are showcased entrepreneurs, and I invite you to continue the conversation with them.